Now we're going to go visit a bog, and bogs are very unique and special places. A bog is really just simply a low area where the water table stays really close to the surface. The soils are somewhat acidic, and because of that, uh, layer upon layer of decaying plant matter usually accumulates. And the Wheats Bay Bog is a very unique place because we have actually put a boardwalk through the bog so that visitors can go through there and see all the plants up close without actually damaging the bog. And the most common question that most people ask when they visit the bog and see it for the first time is, why isn't the bog wet? Because most people are more familiar with cranberry bogs in the Northeast or peat bogs. Well, the bogs in South Alabama and along the northern Gulf Coast don't have a lot of peat in them, and they also don't have cranberries in them. But our bogs have very special plants, which are carnivorous plants, and there are several different species of carnivorous plants in our bog, one of which is called the white top pitcher plant. And these pitcher plants dominate, are the dominant pitcher plant species in our particular bog. Along with pitcher plants, we have some little pink sundews, which are about the size of a quarter, and we also have some threadleaf sundews, and those two uh, carnivorous plants actually trap and digest gnats. They obviously, um, you can see from the little sticky dew drops on them, that they are not large enough to trap anything as big as a moth or a lizard in the case of some things that we have seen in pitcher plants before. You know, when most people hear the word carnivorous plant, they think about something like this. This is Adam and it looks like he's totally being consumed by kudzu. And kudzu is an invasive exotic species of plant that has just about eaten the whole southeastern United States. But that's not really what carnivorous plants are all about. Carnivorous plants are really um, plants like these that you'll see out in the bog, and there's a really good reason why carnivorous plants trap insects and digest them. And at this point, um, we're going to roll the, some more footage to let you know about those plants. Students are fascinated by carnivorous plants, sometimes called insectivorous plants. A great deal of biology may be learned by studying them. They don't capture insects for a food source. Like all green plants, they're able to make their own food by photosynthesis, but they need the nutrients found in insects to build their tissues when they grow and reproduce. In most settings, plants and animals die their nutrients are returned to the environment by decomposers and the nutrients are then absorbed by plants that reincorporate the nutrients into their own molecules. In wetland environments like bogs, water is stagnant and therefore low in oxygen. Compounds from decaying plants accumulate and increase the acidity over the water. When the water becomes acidic, two things happen. First, many microorganisms which aid in the decomposition cannot function, so when the plants die they do not rapidly decay. They just become waterlogged. With little decomposition, there are few nutrients for plants. Second, when the soil is very acidic, it is difficult for a plant to assimilate nutrients. Both of these factors, decreased composition and the difficulty in obtaining nutrients from acid water, contribute to make bogs nutrient-poor habitats. Since the carnivorous plants are unable to get enough nitrogen from the soil, their leaf structures have adapted over time to be able to trap and digest insects. Proteins of the insects' bodies are rich in nitrogen, and the carnivorous plants can use this nitrogen for their own purposes. So carnivorous plants are photosynthesizing sugars and starches used for energy, but are trapping insects as a source of nutrients, in this case nitrogen. In addition to low availability of nutrients, fire is also an important component of bogs. Fire inhibits the growth of woody shrubs. Bog plants are adapted to fire. Fire triggers reproduction and growth and inhibits competition. Scott, 
how about we uh, cut one of these pitcher plants and we'll see what's in it. Now this is actually the, the leaf of a pitcher plant. They grow out in the bog like this and the leaf um, is very long and as you can see the leaf is green. So because it's green it can actually photosynthesize just like any other green plant photosynthesizes. But as you saw from the um, video clip earlier, carnivorous plants actually use insects as sort of like people use vitamins. The bog soils, because they're acidic, that is very nasty, isn't it? And I wish this was smell-o-vision because it really reeks. It smells extremely bad. And uh, I told you that we had love bugs here, and it looks like that this pitcher plant is just completely engorged with mainly love bugs, but I see a couple of other bugs that Scott's picking out here for us. And as I was saying, carnivorous plants actually use the insects like people use vitamins. They produce their own food through photosynthesis, but because the soils in the bog are very acidic, and they're hydric, they don't hold very much nitrogen. And so these plants are actually digesting the insects and using them as um, a way to get more nitrogen that they need. Okay, Scott, tell us about some of these insects that you can see. There's, there's several moths, um, both large and small, many different kinds of flies, but uh, the preponderance is love bugs. These are a black fly that is common around here. And uh, as you go down the, the plant from the top to the bottom, you see they become more and more digested. Down in this area, they're almost liquid. They've been, they're more digested and that's where the plant is absorbing the nutrients from this water. Uh, this particular type of pitcher plant is the dominant pitcher plant out in the Weeks Bay bog and it's called a white top pitcher plant. Pitcher plants are called pitchers because, oh, we have another bug that's trying to get in the pitcher plant as we're talking. It's buzzing around on the tray. Um, pitcher plants are called pitcher plants because of their shape and they uh, actually don't hold, this particular variety doesn't hold a lot of water. Like if you went out in the bog and you picked one and you tried to pour the water out of it, there really wouldn't be any water that would come out much. There would be, in this case, love bug juice, which smells really, really bad. Um, but there is liquid down in the bottom of this plant. And when the insect crawls down into the top of this plant, then there are some little tiny hairs that line the upper hood of the plant. And as the insect climbs down into the plant, then the downward pointing hairs actually trap the bug and keep it from flying out. Now, Scott can probably tell us what he thinks attracts the insects to the pitcher plant. Well, for one thing, uh, especially in the case of these plesia, these love bugs, the color of the pitcher plant itself and the patterning and also the carbon dioxide given off by the, di by the decomposing organisms within the plant, uh, both of those attract flying these, these flies. Uh, also, basically, so it's scent and color. One of the reasons why these plants have these bright red and white tops to them is they attract flying insects with that color. And the other day when we were dissecting a pitcher plant, for the first time, we actually found a lizard that was decomposing inside the pitcher plant. And I think it's probably a toss up as to which thing actually smelled the worse. I can't think of anything that smells worse than these love bugs. How about you, Adam? You think these bugs smell bad? They smell pretty bad.